The 24 Hours of Le Mans is complete, and once again, it is a race that goes down into the history books. So much happened, including multiple cars in a race lead battle in hypercar all race long, the Le Mans debut of the new LM GT3 class, back and forth rain, and much more. This is the race review for the 92nd edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, taking place in 2024. For this event, 62 cars would line up on the grid at the iconic Circuit de la Sar. After his teammate Kevin Estra secured the fastest time in Hyperpole, Lawrence Vantor would start on pole position in the number 6 Porsche Penske, and he would lead the field to green to start this 24-hour endurance race. The start of this race was clean across all three classes participating, with no major incidents happening which was a great sign. In Hypercar, the number 6 Porsche continued to lead. However, the Ferraris were making up ground fast, while the Cadillacs started to drop back. The number 50 car impressively jumped to 2nd at the first braking zone from 4th on the grid, and by the time we reached Indianapolis, the number 50 car had taken the lead of Le Mans from Lawrence Vantor's number 6 Porsche. Later on, the number 51 Ferrari which won Le Mans last year was able to jump into 2nd, it was now a Ferrari 1-2, and the 83 car wasn't far behind either. As the first lap completed, the pole sitting number 14 AO by TF entry was still leading in LMP2, and same goes for the pole sitting car in LMGT3, that being the number 70 Inception McLaren, but the number 66 JMW Ferrari had gotten ahead of the number 92 Manti Pure Racing Porsche into second position. Our first off-track moment happened when Marco Wittmann in the number 15 BMW had a spin just before Tete de Rouge. Thankfully the entry was able to get back in the race, but when it rejoined it would not be in the top 10. BMW Team WRT unfortunately would not have a great Le Mans, and this was just the start of the issues as the number 20 BMW, which is the art car liveried entry, went off at the Ford Chicane. This of course was bad news for BMW. The number 20 car would soon go into the garage, and unfortunately, this car would effectively stay in the garage for the majority of the race. For me as a fan of BMW, it was really hard to see them have such a difficult time in the hypercar category this year, but sometimes that's just how it goes at this iconic venue. And another manufacturer that wasn't having a good day was Alpine. The A424s looked competitive, however, they weren't reliable. Just over 4 hours into the event, the number 35 Alpine with Ferdinand Habsburg behind the wheel was heading down into Arnage and smoke appeared at the back. This meant that the Austrian racer had to stop the A424 and ultimately retire. This was because of an engine failure. Things unfortunately got worse for the Alpine endurance team when the number 36 car went into the pit lane with a similar engine issue and was forced to retire. This unfortunately meant that both hypercars were now out of the race, and with that, Alpine's challenge at Le Mans in 2024 was over. As time progressed, back up in the lead in the hypercar category, the number 83 customer AF Corsa Ferrari was doing really well in the race lead, and had a good gap to the factory number 50 Ferrari in second place. With the 83 Ferrari still leading a few hours into the event, another team that was doing really well was Toyota Gazoo Racing in hypercar. The GR010s, which had won Le Mans before twice in 2021 and 2022, were placed in the top 5. After its lap times were removed in qualifying, the number 7 Toyota started at the back of the field, but was thankfully able to move towards the front as the race progressed. Toyota have a lot of experience at Le Mans, and that experience, along with the pace of the GR010, was definitely allowing the manufacturer to fight for overall victory across this event with the likes of Ferrari and Porsche. Over in LM GT3, the Ford Mustang GT3s were going really well. Ford had brought three entries, all run by Proton Competition. The number 77 car in particular was looking really strong, and this was great to see, considering that the Mustangs hadn't had a perfect start to their journey in the WEC. During Ford's last return to Le Mans in 2016, they actually ended up winning the GT Pro category with the all-new Ford GT. The question now was, would Ford be able to repeat that performance here in 2024 with the all-new Mustang GT3? Now a major factor that would affect this race would be the rain, which would come and go throughout the event. 
When it comes to these conditions, strategies are key, and some work out for certain teams and some do not, and that was the case here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. For example, these changeable conditions benefited Toyota Gazoo Racing to allow them to move closer to the podium positions and be in contention for the overall win. Now I know I said the number 77 Ford was having a pretty competitive race, however it was forced to come to the garage later on because the steering rack broke and this unfortunately meant that it was out of any contention for a successful result. Despite this disappointment for Ford, the other entries from Proton Competition weren't doing too bad. The number 88 car even led LMGT3 during the nighttime hours. The number 77 Proton Ford was not the only entry in LMGT3 suffering issues. The pole city number 70 Inception McLaren was wheeled into the pit lane with steam coming from underneath the hood. This wasn't the end of the road for the number 70 McLaren, but this would significantly hurt their results in the race. It unfortunately was not a good race for McLaren in general, as later on the United Autosport entries would find misfortunes within the event. In the nighttime hours, Polish racer Robert Kubica was flying behind the wheel of the number 83 customer AF Corsa Ferrari. Following the Ferrari was the number 5 Porsche Penske, which was in that position for a little while while the number 8 Toyota was in third. The number 83 Ferrari unfortunately would not be staying in first position for that long though, and this was because it was handed a penalty. The penalty was for a collision between Robert Kubica in the 83 Ferrari, who was lapping Dries Vantor in the number 15 BMW. Thankfully the Belgian racer was okay, but the number 15 BMW's day at Le Mans was over. The collision resulted in a 30 second stop and go penalty for the 83 Ferrari, which dropped it not only from the race lead, but outside the top 5 in hypercar. Taking over the lead was Ryo Hirakawa in the number 8 Toyota, followed by the number 6 Porsche, and the sister Toyota, the number 7 car. And unfortunately for Team WRT, they were about to hit a low point in the LM GT3 class. Despite the M4 GT3 showing pretty good pace, the number 46 car even led the event with Valentino Rossi behind the wheel. It ended up retiring when Ahmed El Harti went off at the exit of the Dunlop overpass, and this resulted in the car being damaged and not able to continue on with the event. This retirement was of course heartbreaking for not just BMW fans, but for fans of Valentino Rossi because he and the number 46 crew were now no longer participating in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Just a reminder, these conditions at the time were very tricky to manage. Ahmed Al Harti's car was using slick tires on a track that was kind of damp, so to make a mistake like this is understandable. After the number 46 car retired, Team WRT had one more entry still in the race that could theoretically achieve a successful result, and that was the Imola winning number 31 M4 GT3. Over in the LMP2 class, the number 30 Duquesne entry was forced to stop on the track with an engine failure. You could even see fire coming from the Orica 07, which of course was not a good sign. Thankfully driver JB Simina was able to jump out of the car unhurt, but this was definitely a not so great result for the Duquesne team in LMP2. Rain became an even larger factor in this race when it got so intense to the point that the race would have to go under safety car conditions, and the weather resulted in a safety car period for over four hours. Thankfully, the situation at Le Mans wasn't like the one we had at the 24 hours of Nürburgring earlier this year, when we saw the majority of the race paused because of the weather, but the weather was most definitely affecting this Le Mans race. I also wanted to point out that a few of the car's roofs were leaking with water. Notably, the number 19 Lamborghini had this issue, but thankfully driver Roman Grosjean was able to fix the issue from inside the cockpit of the SC63. Speaking of the Lamborghini SC63s, they were actually having a really good race. This was of course Lamborghini's first attempt at prototype racing at Le Mans, and to have both of their cars still running, that being the number 19 and number 63, with no reliability issues, if I might add, was pretty impressive from the Italian brand. Eventually, on Sunday morning, the rain would ease up enough for the racing to resume, and after the long safety car procedure, which was conducted by race control, the racing got back underway with under 8 hours to go. 
Once racing got back underway, Dutch racer Nick de Vries in the number 7 Toyota had to make an unscheduled pit stop because of poor visibility. De Vries brought the car back to the pits, and Toyota Gazoo Racing fixed the issue while simultaneously refueling the car. However, this ultimately moved the number 7 outside the top 8 positions. With the number 8 Toyota still at the front, more dramatic moments happened for some of the entries across the field. The number 4 Porsche Penske crashed at Indianapolis, with Felipe Nazar behind the wheel. Out of the three factory Penske entries, the number 4 Porsche was unfortunately having the most difficult time out on track, and this crash would ultimately end their race completely. This race did not go the way of the IMSA drivers Nick Tandy, Matthew Jaminet, and Felipe Nazar, but thankfully they bounced back stronger at the IMSA race at Watkins Glen. Arguably, the biggest crash during the race happened at the Indianapolis corner when an Aston Martin turned upside down. This was the number 27 Heart of Racing Vantage GT3, which had to go wide at the previous turn, and this was the catalyst for the big crash. Thankfully, driver Daniel Mancinelli was okay, and got out of the car on his own, but this was definitely a massive impact. Back up in Hypercar, Cadillac had some misfortunes of their own. The 311 Wheelin Cadillac suffered a crash at Indianapolis, the same place the number 4 Porsche crashed earlier. The 311 Cadillac would make it back to the pits, but the car would lose so many laps. The number 3 Cadillac, which started second in the race, ended up retiring because of a mechanical issue, with six-time IndyCar champion Scott Dixon behind the wheel at the time. Later on, a devastating moment happened for the number 83 Ferrari 499P, which was forced to retire because of an electrical issue. This was heartbreaking for the number 83 AF Corsa crew, as they had led a lot of this race and had an opportunity for the overall win before this unexpected retirement. With the number 83 Ferrari now out of the race and with around three hours to go, it was clear that this would still be an intense end to this event, with nine cars still on the lead lap in hypercar and in contention for the overall victory. Four different manufacturers had the ability to win. This included Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, and Cadillac with their number two blue-nosed V-Series R still in the top 10. Meanwhile, in LMP2, the number 37 Cool Racing entry was in contention for the win of the class. However, a broken windscreen wiper unfortunately ended its chances of taking the win. The number 22 United entry was running a really good race and up at the front in the LMP2 category, and it consistently stayed there pretty much till the end of the event. When the next pit stop phase came around for the hypercars, there was drama for the second placed number 8 Toyota, which was the best placed GR010 at the time. An issue with the wheel gun lost the number 8 Toyota time to the race leading number 50 Ferrari and unfortunately, more drama happened later on for the number 8 Toyota, when Brendan Hartley was spun around by the number 51 Ferrari, and this put the number 8 Toyota pretty much out of contention for the win. Towards the end of the race, the battle for the win came down to mainly two entries, the number 7 Toyota and the number 50 Ferrari. Now before moving on, there is an interesting fact that I wanted to mention. One of the reasons why I believe Porsche, along with Cadillac, weren't on the same competitive form as Toyota and Ferrari near the end is to do with the regulations themselves. Toyota and Ferrari are both running the LMH regulations with their respective cars, and these regulations offer the car four-wheel drive, where manufacturers like Porsche and Cadillac, for instance, who are running the LMDH cars, only have entries with rear-wheel drive. So with the difficult conditions like they were, Toyota and Ferrari may have had a slight advantage simply because of their cars centered around the Le Mans hypercar regulations. In the final laps of this race, it was Ferrari ahead of Toyota. Nicholas Nielsen was on board the number 50 Ferrari and trying to manage a gap to Jose Mario Lopez in the number 7 Toyota while trying to make the end of the race with enough fuel in the car. Toyota Gazoo Racing decided to box Jose Mario Lopez for fuel, however, this lost them time to the number 50 Ferrari, who didn't stop. Lopez, who had been brought in last minute to replace an injured Mike Conway, was lapping faster than the number 50 Ferrari. However, 
Nicholas Nielsen managed the intense situation well and brought the number 50 Ferrari AF Corsa to victory lane at Le Mans. Not only had the number 50 crew of Antonio Fuoco, Miguel Molina, and Nicholas Nielsen won their first race, but Ferrari had gone back to back at Le Mans because they won last year in 2023. This incredible win allowed Ferrari to achieve their 11th win at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and they truly deserved it. The number 7 Toyota came home in a frustrating second place, with the number 51 Ferrari holding off the number 6 Porsche by one second for the podium. Interestingly, for the first time in Le Mans history, the top 9 cars overall finished on the same lap which just reiterates why the hypercar regulations are so successful. In LMP2, it was the number 22 United entry that held on to first position, with Oliver Jarvis, Nolan Siegel, and Bajoy Garg taking the victory in the number 22 car, a fantastic win for the United Autosports crew. And finally, in LMGT3, it was the number 91 Manti EMA Porsche that took the win, their second of this season. Drivers Morris Shireen, Richard Leitz, and Yasser Shaheen drove the Manti EMA entry to victory lane and gifted Porsche the first win of LMGT3 at Le Mans. Out of the new hypercars to visit Le Mans, Lamborghini finished with the best results. Both SC63s were very reliable across the event and finished. The number 63 car even achieved a top 10 result, finishing in 10th position. Speaking of the new hypercar manufacturers, I wanted to mention Isota Fraschini because their Tipo 6 LMHC was able to finish the 24 hours of Le Mans. Remember, Isota Fraschini is the smallest and newest manufacturer in prototype endurance racing. So to see them not just finish their first 24 hours of Le Mans, but finish and outlast the likes of Alpine and BMW, who unfortunately encountered their own issues, was seriously impressive. Like the SC63, the Stolta Fraschini hypercar was also really reliable, so they for sure did a great job during their first outing at Le Mans. Speaking of big results, not only did the Ford Mustang GT3 achieve its first podium at Le Mans, but first in endurance racing in general. Despite the number 77 Ford steering rack issue, it was a great result for Ford at Le Mans. The number 88 Proton car got on the podium with the number 44 Le Mans exclusive entry just behind in fourth. So that completes my race review for the 2024 24 Hours of Le Mans. What an epic race that was. And now we have to start counting down the days until the 2025 event. What did you think about this 24 hour endurance race this year? Was it one for the history books? Well, let me know all your thoughts down in the comments. Thanks for watching. For more content on endurance racing such as the WEC and IMSA, consider subscribing if you haven't already. On screen, you'll find some suggested videos to watch next. For now though, that's it for me. You'll hear from me next in the following video.